Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our Engage session this month featuring Landsat 9. Landsat 9 is slated to launch from California in one month, and we felt that it was a good time to bring Landsats to everyone's attention prior to the launch. The Engage series was created in order to engage the NASA and Goddard workforce in specific missions, projects, technologies, etc. In this virtual environment, we have expanded that to the larger population outside of the workforce. For this event specifically, we are honored to have teamed up with the Getting to Know Goddard series, a speaker series for the public, and the Maryland Space Business Roundtable to expand our reach and engage with more people in the workforce, the country, and potentially across the globe. We always like to know a little more about those who are joining us today. In the chat box, tell us how many people are watching from your screen. If it's just you, just type one. A couple of housekeeping items to go through before we get started. First, our producer is located in an area that potentially could have storms. So if that happens, the session will end. Hopefully that won't happen. Second, the chat feature on the right-hand side of your screen has been enabled in order for you to interact and ask questions of our speakers today. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the panel, and we will get to as many questions as time permits. Lastly, if you require closed captioning, please hover over the CC button at the bottom of the video. If closed captioning does not work at this time, the recording will be made available after the event ends. Now, I would like to introduce one of our collaborators on today's event. Ms. Georgie Brophy, president of the Maryland Space Business Roundtable, will kick off the event today with opening remarks. Ms. Brophy? Thanks, Bree. Hello everyone and welcome. It is wonderful to join you today for a truly special event. I am Georgie Brophy, Senior Director of Business Development at Relative Dynamics and President of the Maryland Space Business Roundtable. We are really happy to be partnering with both the Engage series and the Getting to Know Goddard series this month to bring you a special event on Earth Science and the upcoming Landsat 9 launch. Many of our MSBR corporate members are proud to support the Landsat 9 mission and are engaged in earth science efforts throughout the center. For our members, please keep an eye out as we are looking to go back to live events um, this fall as, as things allow. And so look for notices in your emails and we'll be excited to be with you back in person again. We are having our annual meeting in uh, September and you'll hear about that too. But in the meantime, please remember to submit your questions today via the chat box and enjoy this exceptional panel. Thanks, Bree. Thank you, Georgie. Now I would like to introduce our speakers for today's event. The event will be in two parts. First, we will hear from Dr. Jim Irons, the director of the Earth Science Division at Goddard Space Flight Center. Dr. Irons is going to discuss Earth science and how it impacts us in our daily lives. Dr. Irons has been involved with Landsat series for many years. Therefore, after his remarks, it is only fitting that he leads the discussion on Landsat 9. Dr. Irons will be joined by Melody Jam, Tiers 2 Deputy Instrument Project Manager, Dr. Jeffrey Pedalty, OLI2 Instrument Resident Manager, and Nima Pullivan, Remote Sensing Scientist for the panel discussion on all things Landsat 9. After the panel, as already has been said, we will take questions from the audience. Also, we will attempt to get to as many questions as possible in the time that we have. <coughs> it is now my absolute privilege to introduce Dr. Irons to give his special remarks on earth science. Dr. Irons. Thank you, Bree, and uh, welcome to everybody to our uh, session this afternoon. Uh, as Bree said, I'm privileged to serve as the director of the Earth Sciences Division at Goddard. It's one of the largest uh, Earth science uh, groups in the world. And um, wi within our group uh, and across Goddard, uh, GFC Earth Sciences uh, covers the full scope of the NASA Earth Science Program. We plan, design, launch, and operate many of the NASA satellites 
that observe the oceans, uh, atmosphere, ice caps, continents, and life on Earth from space. Uh, at the moment, NASA has uh, about 23 uh, satellite uh, systems in low Earth orbit observing the Earth, and NASA Goddard managed the development and launch, by my count, of 16 of those uh, satellite systems. Uh, we also supplement our observations from space with uh, observations from aircraft uh, and from the ground and from the surface of the ocean and even below the ocean uh, through field campaigns and uh, ocean cruises uh, and activities like that. Uh, collectively, we analyze these observations and apply the information to understand how all these components interact as an integrated global system. We develop models to better describe the state of the Earth system and to predict how the Earth will change in response to cl the climate and our own human activities. Today, however, we're going to focus on one of our Earth observing satellite programs, the Landsat program, which is approaching its 50th year uh, next year uh, as it began with the launch of Landsat 1 in 1972. So we manage this program in collaboration with a partner agency, the U.S. Geological Survey within the Department of the Interior. Today's panel consists of Goddard scientists and engineers who are engaged in the Landsat program and involved with the development and launch of Landsat 9. And we're all very ex excited about the scheduled launch of the ninth Landsat satellite on September 16th from the Vandenberg Space Force Base. So first, I'm going to start off uh, by asking a, a question of each of the panel members, since I know a uh, little bit about their background. And then hopefully um, after these questions and the response, you will open up uh, through the chat a, uh, a number of questions that we can uh, ask of the panel and, and allow them time to address. So uh, I'm going to start with Jeff, Jeff Peddledy. I know you have recently worked on the integration and testing of the Landsat 9 spacecraft observatory. Could you tell us uh, about the steps taken to ensure the Landsat 9 spacecraft and instrument payload can survive launch and they operate successfully in the harsh environment of space? And uh, tell us a little bit what, about what your role was in the uh, was in the process. And I know your uh, academic background is astrophysics, so. Tell us a little bit about how you got involved in the Landsat program and Earth observations. Hey, thanks, Jim, and good day to uh, everyone. Uh, I just want to start by saying that how truly honored I am to uh, be able to join this panel to talk about Landsat 9. A project like this requires thousands of people over you know several years to get Landsat 9 ready for launch. So. I'm going to do my best to represent you know, the many colleagues and friends I've worked with along the way. So I'm a Goddard civil servant, but I've had the amazing opportunity to work and live at our two key industrial partner sites, namely Northrop Grumman in Gilbert, Arizona, and Ball Aerospace in Boulder, Colorado, where I am now. Ball built and tested the OLI-2 instrument while Northrop is uh, responsible for building the spacecraft and connecting the two instruments and then testing the whole observatory. And I thank them very much for their hospitality. And as you say, space is a challenging environment and we really must do everything we can to make sure that our hard work uh, survives launch and makes it uh, works on orbit as long as possible. So if something were to break, we want it to break on the ground where we can fix it. Um, so we have an environmental test campaign that I like to summarize as shake, bake, and radiate, although not quite in that poetic order. Now the shake part is how we make sure the observatory survives the rough ride to orbit. So yeah, you know, that launch sequence in Apollo 13 gives you an idea what Landsat 9 will experience. So to test that on the ground, we bolt the observatory to a shaker table and we vigorously vibrate it up and down, side to side, to and fro, to simulate the launch as best we can, uh, even though the Atlas V shakes us in all three axes at once. The rocket cells are very loud, so we blast the observatory with surround sound, very large speakers, 
And as you can imagine, watching a vibration test like this uh, does make for some anxious moments. But Landsat 9 survived this uh, phase just perfectly. The bake portion is done in a vacuum chamber since, of course, there's no air in space and we need to observe, uh, expose the observatory to the extremes uh, hot and cold that we'll experience on orbit. So this piece for the observatory took about a month of 24 by 7 operations. So that was stressing for both people and the observatory. We repeatedly took uh, Landsat 9 between hot and cold extremes basically trying to break it while well, honestly very much hoping that nothing broke. Um, we thoroughly tested each instrument at each temperature plateau extreme and we generated lots of image data that I'll talk about in a bit. And thankfully we now didn't break the observatory and uh, people can always recover from sleep. So I don't think there was any permanent harm on that sleep deprivation. Uh, but as you can expect, we learned a lot as we tested. And then the radiate piece, which is actually how we began, is also called electromagnetic interference and compatibility. So that makes sure all pieces of the observatory work together and can work within the space environment. So to bring that home, it's like making sure that the TV picture doesn't get fuzzy when you're on the vacuum cleaner or the blender. And if you're too young to know what I'm talking about, just ask your parents or maybe your grandparents. Uh, but seriously, uh, we do need to confirm that the instrument images don't get noisy or blurry when we fly over something like a ground radar or if a heater turns on or something like that. Jim will remember that we fixed just such an issue like that on Landsat 7 only uh, about four months before we launched. The Landsat 9 is just in great shape uh, at this stage. And then finally, you asked me about my role. My expertise is mainly with the instruments and the uh, utterly critical image data that they, they generate. Uh, these images, after all, are why we built Landsat in the first place. And we worked with our USGS partners at Northrop Grumman to build a ground station where we capture, process, and evaluate all those images just as if the observatory were flying overhead, even though literally it was just next door in a clean room. So with that uh, so-called hallway ground station, we captured many, many terabytes of image data. And we had to look at those data to make sure that the detectors are all working in each instrument, mirrors, lenses stay clean, and all the spacecraft electronics that send the data to the ground uh, work without error. Uh, we looked very carefully. We could detect if even a single bit flipped from zero to one or one to zero. Um, our careful checking did reveal a couple of rare errors that are fit within our budget for errors, but that's after all why we test. And uh, so I worked on seven and eight and processed lots of data from there, and I can definitely confidently say that uh, Landsat 9 generated the most data of the three, and I truly cannot wait till we see those uh, very valuable and, uh, and truly beautiful images start flowing from space. So obviously you could get a sense that the details could take hours to talk, but I, I hope that's a good start and I'm happy to answer questions later and maybe later I'll talk about how an astrophysicist uh, gets in this business, but that's a longer story. Thanks, Jeff. That was great. <clears throat> uh, next, I'm going to uh, turn to Mel Melody Jam. Melody, uh, you are the deputy project manager for the thermal instrument on Landsat 9 called Tiers 2. And I know you worked on the first version of the instrument, uh, which is currently operating on Landsat 8, and it's called Tears. And that instrument encountered some problems with stray light that impacted the data. Can you describe the problem and the steps that were taken in the design and building of Tears 2 to prevent a recurrence of the problem in Tears 2 data? Sure, Jim. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here as part of one of the Tears 2 members. We had around 250 people who built this instrument, so it's an honor to be here representing the big, huge team that uh, built this um, payload for and delivered uh, deliver that for launch. So as you mentioned, Tiers 1 thermal infrared sensor uh, got integrated to LDCM Landsat 8 uh, for the first time and um, got on orbit, got launched in 2013. After launch, um, team, Notice that some of the tiers two images um, are showing higher than um, expected ground temperature. 
So after a lot of in, in, uh, investigation, team suspected that it might be a straight line that is coming from outside of the field of view and adding signal, additional signal to um, detector, which creating the bright images. So um, in order to confirm that theory, uh, we started to maneuvering the observatory from the ground, uh, from the Earth, pointing to the moon, using the moon as the calibration source, and started uh, doing the whole scan of the uh, moon, um, left and right, up and down, uh, to get the entire image. Once we got the images, we found out, we proved that, um, sure enough, there are some straight light is coming from the um, you know, telescope lens, lens three, um, which adding additional signal to the um, tiers to detector. Then after that, tiers team, in order to confirm, um, we had spare flight hardware um, at Goddard. We built the spare hardware telescope together. If we put it in front of the calibration source, and sure enough, we confirmed that the lens three is creating some stray lights and um, it provide creating these additional signals. Um, so all these things happened before tiers two. Um, you know, tiers two is like tiers one. We call it built to print, but it really is not. It has a lot of more enhancement. One of them was the stray light. So what we did in order to remove this additional stray light, we added baffle in the optical system to block this additional stray light that is coming into the light path to the detector. Um, that modification uh, started um, via the analysis to make sure it's it's correct. After that, um, we implement that changes to the flight lens three, and uh, performed the, a lot of testing at the instrument at the subsystem level, telescope level, and ambient, and then instrument level in TVAC. And sure enough, it showed that we removed the stray light. But in addition, um, team uh, used the lunar data to create the algorithm so we can you know utilize tiers one data. They remove this additional signal that um, get created every time and um, they um, we can use the uh, tiers one data just like tiers two uh, without any additional images. Uh, thank you, Melody, that uh, that was great and I'm really looking forward to seeing data uh, from tiers two. Uh, it's uh, an important uh, essential component of the uh, Landsat 9 system and uh, I think it'll I think the data will just be of the highest quality. So thank you very much. Uh, lastly, I'm going to turn to Nima, uh, one of our scientists in the Earth Science Division. And uh, e Nima, even though this program is called Landsat, uh, you're a scientist, a researcher that uses Landsat data to study water quality. Can you tell us about your research and why you're looking forward to receiving data from the Landsat 9 satellite? Sure. Um, thank you, Jim, for having me. It's, it's great to represent uh, aquatic remote, sense, remote sensing uh, community today. Um, so I have the privilege of working with uh, a group of um, scientists over the past couple of years. Uh, our team basically focuses on uh, formulating, developing and implementing algorithms for deriving water quality indicators from satellite observations over lakes, reservoirs, rivers and coastal estuaries. For your information, these water quality indicators include concentrations of uh, pigments, particles, or their absorption and scattering properties within the body of water. Our end goal is to <clears throat> enable the uh, creation of consistent and high quality product records from different satellite instruments, including, of course, Landsat sensors for robust studies of aquatic environments and monitoring water quality. In general, our activities entail uh, assessing the accuracy of top of atmosphere radiance measurements, uh, accounting for light scattering and absorption into the atmosphere, uh, converting water living radiance estimates to water quality indicators, uh, creating a web interface to allow scientists and water resource managers access uh, products for validation purposes, and finally, addressing impacts of climate variability and anthropogenic activities and water quality. Uh, we started off our um, efforts about a decade ago prior to launch of Landsat 8, uh, when of course I was a PhD student with Dr. John Schott at Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, I would not exaggerate if I said that Landsat 8 uh, OLI revolutionized, revolutionized the way we study inland and in coastal waters from space because of the radiometric quality of the data. You can imagine our excitement about Landsat 9 OLI2 because of the enhanced revisit frequency of these uh, high quality observations from the two instruments combined. 
Uh, basically, uh, more measurements uh, mean that we will be able uh, to uh, capture rapidly changing phenomena like harmful algal blooms, so-called HAPs, impacts of storm events on water quality, detecting discharges in, into, into uh, water bodies as well. Um, compared to Landsat 8 OLI, the aquatic remote sensing is uh, even more enthusiastic about Landsat 9 OLI too, uh, because of the fact that it's, uh, it, it's uh, going to have improvements in terms of its radiometric precision uh, and their measurements. Uh, we're expecting to see about 20 to 30 percent increase in uh, signal to noise ratios over bodies of water. Um, also, we are very much thrilled about the anticipated high quality thermal data from TIERS 2. In fact, uh, temperature is one of the most critical variables directly related to the spatial and temporal distribution of aquatic habitats, uh, what we call as uh, biodiversity. Um, elevated concentrations of an organic, organic material in water column increase water surface temperature, creating favorable conditions for the onset of uh, harmful algal bloom events. Uh, water resource managers uh, would love to identify these hotspots in advance to take timely actions and plan for mitigation strategies. Uh, besides that, analyzing both uh, TIERS 2 and um, OLI 2 data across highly sensitive aquatic environments uh, like high altitude lakes, uh, polar regions will help us better isolate um, impacts of um, the warming climate in aquatic environments. So um, um, we're very excited, Jim, to uh, to uh, get our hands on uh, Landsat 9 data sets, OLI 2 and TIERS 2, so uh, very much look forward to the launch. Good, thanks, Nima. <clears throat> I wanted to add that uh, Nima was uh, selected <clears throat> through a competitive proposal uh, to serve on the U.S. Geological Survey sponsored Landsat science team. So he is uh, interacting with uh, across the community of people who uh, use um, Landsat data for research and for so so, uh, societal benefit uh, through this team. And that's that's a great to have that representation uh, from Goddard. So I see we're getting uh, questions coming in on the chat and that's wonderful. Um, so I'm just going to throw them out to the panel and uh, ask them to comment. Um, first question, uh, what are you most looking forward to at the launch? And, and our pa panelists are pondering, I'll jump in. Uh, so the, um, you know, so I've been engaged with the Landsat program through most of my career. Uh, and given that it's a 50 year program, um, the archive of data that's maintained by the U.S. Geological Survey at their Earth Resources and Observation, Observation Science Center in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. It's the longest archive record of the Earth's surfaces observed from space. And Landsat 9 is going to continue and advance that record. And our understanding of the evolution of the Earth system depends on multi-decadal observations so we can observe trends and uh, characterize change. So that's what excites me the most. Anybody anybody else from the panel? Yeah, Jim, and I'll jump in here. I had uh, the joy of watching Landsat 7 and Landsat 8, so I just can't wait for the third in person. I've also got the joy of, of just literally being a tourist uh, at the launch, so it really is the the, the spectacular, the sound and the the, the feel of of a, of a rocket like the Atlas V launching is it is just a thrill. But then you realize all of the pieces and all of the people and all of the work is just there. It's all right there on that rocket. Sorry about that. And uh, so that that's the joy for me at at a launch. And then I would ask, how do we, how do we know it's going to work? Yeah, we'll, we'll pick up a radio contact shortly after launch for the spacecraft, and then a couple of days later, we start turning on the instruments, and that's when it, it'll certainly get really exciting for me. But that's that's my perspective. It's just the joy of watching uh, watching like a spectator at launch. All done for me. 
if I can add, Jim. Um, same here. I will be a visitor at launch site, uh, but I'm, you know, we have been working on tiers two since 2015, um, day and night, 24/7 in TVAC. So many thermal vacuum tests that we have done, and the most joyful moment, moment would be when we successfully launch the, uh, you know, Landsat nine and get to the commissioning room and start turning on the hardware and um, start seeing images. We are looking forward to successful launch and start seeing tiers two images um, on uh, from the earth very soon. Uh, likewise here, Jim, uh, we look forward to, um, you know, seeing the first light, uh, getting our hands on the, on the data set and be able to essentially produce high quality products from uh, Landsat 8 and 9 uh, combined. OLI 2, Tiers 2, um, for um, serving the uh, the society um, and enabling uh, water resource monitoring activities. Uh, great, That thank you. Yeah, I was uh, giving presentations to elementary school campers today, attending a camp, uh, sponsor, virtual camp, sponsored by John Hopkins University. And again, I got a similar question, you know, and uh, I, I told those, uh, young students said, if you ever have a chance to go to a, a NASA launch, it's it's really quite an experience where you can feel the power of uh, of those rockets right right in your gut, you know, right right in your intestinal uh, tract as uh, as it takes off and launches and rumbles into space. So that's that's really a cool cool experiment. And uh, this will be my third Landsat launch also, Jeff, and I'm gonna join you as a tourist. So <laughs> that'll be great. Um, so next question, uh, when will you know that Landsat 9 is successful? Go ahead, Melody, you, you were, you were about to say something. Sure, yeah, and so the, um, the first success we'll put as, um, Jeff Penalty mentioned is, uh, you know, the first contact that they're getting as soon as the launch vehicle, uh, get, um, uh, you know, deintegrated from the, um, ULA. That would be the first one, and the most successful one is once you get to an orbit and uh, we'll start turning on the spacecraft and uh, for tiers two would be when we turn on the tiers two. So we have so many successful steps moving, you know, uh, going forward and we're going to celebrate every each of them. <laughs> OK, uh, great. And anybody else want to jump in on that one? No. Good. Yeah, NEMA had mentioned the very first image. Of course, that that was, is always exciting, and uh, you make sure that all the the mirrors and lenses are all appropriate, and you get the right optics, and uh, and you know wait for a good cloud-free moment to uh, to look at the Earth. So uh, a lot of uh, a lot of joys there. The first one for Landsat Seven was over Sioux Falls, over. Landsat 8, the first released image was over Boulder, Colorado and the Front Range. So I had a lot of personal interest in that and uh, we'll see how the events uh, roll out for our first image from uh, Landsat 9. Uh, since I'm talking, I, I, I'm just truly, truly heartened by hearing uh, Nima speak about OLI 2 and the extra radiometric resolution and, and the work that we've done to get a couple of extra bits of resolution in our images and working with the OLI focal plane modules that you know, we first started building in 2009. So uh, uh, thank you. It's just really nice to know that uh, the ultimate customer, which is indeed science, is uh, you know paying attention to all the hard work that uh, has gone into getting those data to you. So uh, happy to be of service. Well, Jeff, that's a great segue into the next question. Uh, we have, uh, how has Landsat improved since Landsat 1 or even Landsat 8? So you you touched on uh, Landsat, uh, Landsat 9 having an improved radiometric resolution, extra bits, um, because the performance of the uh, instruments are, are so well that you'll be digitizing signal instead of noise with those extra bits. Uh, what else can uh, any one of you tell us about improvements since Landsat 1? Or am I the only one old enough to remember Landsat 1? I don't know. Well, I have to go into the history books, but I think that Landsat 1 had about five bits, right? So maybe 32 gray levels. 
Yeah. Um, and then Landsat 7 went to 8 bits or 256 levels. We went to 12 bits and, uh, you know, 2000 levels. Now we get, uh, uh, sorry, 4000 levels. And now we're at uh, nearly 16,000. So that picture your your commercial camera, you're, you're just getting a lot more ability to to sense subtle differences in, in brightness of the reflected light uh, that you measure with OLI too. So, uh, and I'll, I'll let Melody talk about uh, tears. So in tears, one of the things that got improved, as I mentioned, was stray light, of course. Um, the other improvement that we did um, was um, we added redundancy. Now, uh, you know, tiers two is class B emission, meaning that, you know, it has to operate longer than tiers one. So we have more boxes, electronic boxes that can operate and um, we can, you know, it would be a longer time to get um, tiers two images either from, um, you know, uh, one boxes versus the other box. So we have um, full redundancy in electronics, more robust and reliability to provide the data to scientists. Um, so, you know, with respect to Landsat 1, I can go on and on uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, aquatic environments and aquatic science. So, um, the, but one of the most important thing is uh, radiometric um, accuracy. Uh, you know, we talked about precision, uh, but the, the stability of the instrument over time is, is um, highly critical in our applications in the aquatic uh, uh, world. Basically, um, uh, enhanced revisit frequency uh, with uh, with two uh, Landsat missions are you know uh, allowing us to uh, to provide um, more frequent uh, data sets uh, to um, customers out there. And uh, I think besides um, you know aquatic environments, I, I believe. Since Landsat 1 and to Landsat 5 and 7, uh, you know, we're right now we're able to do precise and accurate measurements of uh, cryosphere science. So I think that's also a major improvement over, um, uh, you know, heritage Landsat missions. So that's also exciting to that community. Um, so I, I, I totally see that the excitement uh, within the uh, cryosphere science uh, community. Great. Thanks. I'll add um, with Landsat 1 through Landsat. Uh, five, uh, when we uh, began operations of Landsat 7, we made some significant improvements first in the um, duty cycle and the coverage of the Earth. So we took data more often, uh, left the instruments on for a longer period of time. So we captured uh, the Earth's surface uh, more fully with Landsat 7, and that's extended through Landsat 8 and Landsat 9. Um, second, uh, we paid a great deal of attention to calibration. And uh, we've improved the calibration of the instruments. Uh, and so that the images you see from Landsat are just not pretty pictures. Every, each pixel is really a scientific measurement uh, that measures the amount of energy reflected uh, from the Earth's surface and transmitted through the atmosphere in multiple spectral bands. Um, and there was a third advancement that's, oh, and finally, uh, one of the biggest things is um, in 2008, um, the U.S. Geological Survey made what I considered an institutionally courageous decision to distribute data at no cost to anybody who requested it. So prior to um, 2008, USGS had been charging $600 per scene, and most people couldn't afford very many scenes, and the analyses were conducted one scene at a time. Now people are downloading thousands of scenes uh, from the USGS and from uh, secondary um, archives of the data that copy it from USGS like Google Earth and they're doing analyses with thousands of data and looking not only between year at between year changes but within year changes uh, to better characterize the processes that are going on uh, on on the surface of the earth so those are those were three major advances I could go on but we only have a half hour so I'm going to move on to the next question um, 
Let's see. How does Landsat work with other satellites that Goddard people work on? Nima, yeah, Nima, you why don't you take that one? Yeah, um, sure. So, um, well, the the major use of um, Landsat has been primarily um, on land cover land use change. Uh, for the years, um, USGS and NASA gathered scientists have been using Landsat data to look into um, how um, climate variability and anthropogenic activities impact uh, land cover land use change. So that's the first thing comes to my mind in terms of how uh, Landsat gets used at, at Goddard. With other satellites, uh, there is there is always a sort of a um, science on the integration and fusion of Landsat data with MODIS, uh, Aqua Terra, and other sources of um, uh, satellite measurements to uh, to be able to essentially uh, combine um, you know a high revisit frequency of MODIS data with a less uh, so uh, Landsat data to enable a uh, integrated data set for uh, land cover, land use change, monitoring and mapping. Um, so this is this, this is basically something that comes to my mind, Jim. Great, great. I, I wanted to add, Nima, that we, we do have a, a Landsat Sentinel-2, what we call harmonized product. So the Earth, uh, excuse me, the European Space Agency has launched two satellites Sentinel called Sentinel-2A and Sentinel-2B that are Landsat-like in their capabilities. And between Landsat-8 now and Sentinel-2A and 2B, uh, we have much more frequent coverage of the Earth's surface. And uh, one of our colleagues, Jeff Masek, who is the Landsat-9 project scientist, has led an effort to um, create a data set where the, the data from uh, Landsat-8 and the data from the Sentinel-2 satellites is, is pretty much indistinguishable so that uh, time series analyses can be conducted with uh, much more frequent observations. Um, so that's a that's a big advancement. Thanks. Thanks to Jeff's leadership. Uh, the next I, I uh, welcome the really welcome the next uh, question, I, I, but I'll let uh, somebody else have first dibs on it. Uh, but the next question is, can you talk about the ways that Landsat data is used that was never imagined when Landsat was conceived many years ago? So just uh, and Nima, well, Nima's already talked about using it for uh, his water quality observations. That really wasn't uh, imagined a long time ago. Absolutely. Uh, there is, you know, from Landsat 1 um, to 7 uh, and then to 8 and right now we're talking about Landsat 9. The, uh, the, 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 the improvement in the uh, sensor technology has been so um, incredible that uh, that's allowing us to essentially uh, perform um, accurate and precise studies of uh, water quality and how it varies and how, you know, how it responds to uh, climate change and um, human activities. Uh, these are these were not um, type of scientific studies or applications that were conceived for Landsat, uh, primarily focused on land monitoring and land changes. So uh, thanks to the all the work that engineers uh, have done uh, for Landsat 8 and 9, OLI, especially OLI 2 and Tiers 2, um, we're very much look forward to even further advancement, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, for uh, aquatic environment and the relevant studies. Jeff, do you, want, do you have anything to add to that? No, I don't really think I do. Uh, you had mentioned earlier just the whole Earth coverage, right? We, we were just doing a fraction of the Earth and felt good to reach a fraction of the Earth with, uh, with Landsat 7 and now we're expecting every bit of the land mass every time we go over and we'll achieve that. So uh, just having, and, and then now with two Landsat 8 and Landsat 9, you'll get the whole Earth every eight days. So I, I, those are the kind of data that I'm really excited to give to uh, my, my science colleagues uh, to, uh, to have fun with. Well, I'm, I'm gonna jump in. Um... Some of our colleagues, uh, scientists in the field, have been using Landsat 8 data to measure the 
uh, velocity of glacier flows. And uh, until the uh, we achieved improved radiometric resolution with Landsat 8 uh, instruments, uh, there were features on the sur surface of glaciers uh, that were subtle and couldn't really be resolved in uh, data from the earlier satellites. But now with Landsat 8 and even better with Landsat 9, they can track the um, change in those features over time and measure uh, glacial velocities. Um, with the, uh, go ahead, Melody. I was going to say um, for tiers, uh, one of the big motivation was to determine water usage by vegetation. And the most important one recently is using the data for glacier monitoring, as you're saying, land use changes of, you know, forest fire tracking and, uh, you know, um, across all uh, water studies that they started doing in uh, it sounds like that is really helping um, the you know data usage both scientists like Nima can talk way more about that um, with tiers one and no tiers two data that, that's a great point we are we are using uh, particularly the thermal data uh, is enabling the uh, monitoring of water consumption for things like irrigation um, so that's been a great advance as well. Good. Thank you for reminding us of that. Um, I, you know, I think I could go on and on. Love that question. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's go to the next one. Is there any update for the thermal sensor in terms of radiometric spatial resolution? Um, not really for tiers two. Tiers two has um, the only different was the uh, stray light that I mentioned. Uh, other than that, tiers two and tiers one from the radi radiometric standpoint are the same. Great. Thank you, Melody. Um, next question is where will Landsat 9 be operated out of after launch? So after, um, after launch, it will be monitored at Goddard, Building 36. Uh, we have a launch control room. Uh, for 90 days, we will do the entire commissioning, meaning that we're going to turn on each subsystem one at a time, OLI 2, Tiers 2, uh, spacecraft subsystem. Uh, once they're fully operational, uh, we do nominal on-orbit uh, operation, 16 days. Um, uh, data imaging, and after that, once the 90 days commissioning is done, we will hand it over to USGS for continuous operation. Uh, January 2022. So the US Geological Survey does operate Landsat 7, Landsat 8, and will operate Landsat 9, but they do so out of Mission Operation Center located at Goddard. So some of our, uh, some of our USGS colleagues uh, and their and their contractors uh, are right uh, right here. Uh, well, we're virtual now, but uh, virtually right here at, at Goddard Space Flight Center. So thanks. Um, let's see. Lots of great questions. This is great. Um, how will Landsat influence how we map other worlds? Oh, there's a good one. I'm, I'm going to throw this one to the astrophysicist. <laughs> You bet, and I was going to jump in and grab it. I, I did have some years in the uh, what we call astrobiology within the NASA community, and so that's uh, a good piece of that was what, what can we learn about the Earth that informs us about what other planets around other stars might be like and how they evolved and, and their chances for life. So we've done things like taking uh, you know, reflected light from from the Earth and and imagine that it is around another star and and try to look at you know, what clues would we look for, what would we observe to try to find out if there's if there's life on on Earth or, or the other Earths uh, in, you know, with oxygen and and that kind of thing. Um, so I would just say that the uh, Landsat data, since you're always looking straight down at the Earth from Landsat, you have to do some uh, manipulating to get it to make it look like it's from a disk of the Earth. So there are other sensors uh, on MODIS, you know, MODIS, for example, that that uh, can be used for that kind of work as well. But uh, it's certainly a very exciting field to be searching for 
uh, other planets and potential life on other planets, which uh, would be major headlines when when that moment comes. I'm loving these questions. I really like the next one. I'm interested in hearing the every one of the panelists answer this one. Mm -hmm. uh, I, the question is, I'd love to hear from at least a couple of the panelists. I'm going to say all the panelists. Mm -hmm. What what was your first memory, inspirational moment from NASA as a kid? How does your career connect with that first moment? Who wants to take that? Who wants to take it first? I can take that first. Great. So before joining Goddard, um, I watched uh, Apollo 13, uh, you soon we have a problem. So it was always that phrase was always in my mind. Um, so when I started joining Goddard, the first thing they told me is looking at, as a, I was a reliability engineer for ELC project. This, um, they asked me to do the detailed design um, of the major circuit board, the main electronic box, um, which if it failed, the whole mission will fail. So every time I was looking at that design, I, in the back of my mind, I was just repeating it to myself that, Melody, we do not want ELC had a problem. We should make sure that we do the right thing and we do not, you know, that we don't, don't have any ELC had a problem. And to this day, even tiers one or tier two, every time we have an issue, in the back of my mind, I keep repeating myself, I do not want to hear Landsat 9, we have a problem. Let's do the right thing and let's get this to the next phase. Who's, who's next? Jeff, you want to you yeah, try I'll, I'll next? jump in as I, I think the senior senior member, uh, your company excluded, of course, Jim, but uh, I'm old enough to remember some of uh, Gemini and very clearly remember Apollo 11 when I was uh, 11 years old and watching that walk. And so there being, you know, Apollo coinciding with middle school, high school kind of left me with a, hmm, I could have the social life or I could be a big space buff. And I think I chose the latter. So uh, there's a lot of that uh, in me. And, um, so that led to astrophysics, which kind of getting back to your, your original question. But I'm not the only astrophysicist who then decided that being in space looking down at the Earth instead of being in space looking out at the other planets and, or, or stars is, is where he, he and she wanted to put uh, you know, personal, uh, personal time. I, I will share, but you've mentioned the Landsat science team and Dr. Martha Anderson is also on the Landsat science team and she and I shared the same thesis advisor in radio astronomy and we both made the same decisions to go from radio astronomy to studying the Earth in our own different ways. So it's uh, not unusual and uh, we only get one life, right? So we have to decide what we're gonna put our energies on. So that, that was my choice. And, and Apollo and NASA were, were a huge part of it. So working for NASA is, is a dream come true. Um, yeah, so uh, my inspiration goes back to um, high school uh, when I started playing around with uh, Landsat and MODIS data. Um, I, I, you know, I was uh, truly amazed by the amount of information that you could get from uh, the Landsat and uh, MODIS data back then. And, um, and, you know, seeing all the images, all the, uh, you know, NASA logo, it just inspired me to essentially pursue an earth science uh, career. And um, uh, at, as Jeff mentioned and Melody mentioned, that's a true honor to work for, for NASA and being affiliated with NASA. Um, it's, it's a great experience. Okay. Thank you, Nima. Uh, so I'll just throw in, first of all, the question assumes that I remember when I was a kid, uh, but uh, <laughs> I, I was um, just got lucky and got a summer job at NASA Lewis Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio, between my junior and senior years in college. And um, interestingly enough, Nima, I got a job uh, working with some researchers who were studying Great Lakes water quality uh, via remote sensing with an airborne sensor. And uh, so I know how to operate a Secchi disk. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, you know, I thought 
I was in a major where I uh, was idealistic, thought I could save the world, and I learned that I could pursue that goal uh, modestly um, while working for NASA and with NASA's uh, brand recognition. That uh, that was just an incredible realization, and uh, just got lucky to have opportunities um, come my way uh, to. Um, Get a job out of uh, out of my graduate pr uh, master's degree at Penn State and pursue a PhD uh, while working at Goddard, and uh, it's it's just been a very great gratifying career. So those those kinds of things come along maybe once in a lifetime, and uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to uh, uh, jump on the opportunities. What what a great question, though. Thank you. Uh, let's see. What is the next question? What is the anticipated operational latency for data products? Availability from on orbit acquisition for L9 will will there will there be near real time products? Do you, do you know, Jeff? This is certainly where we would need our USGS colleagues uh, to join in for a definitive answer. So uh, what, what I can answer is that, you know, imagining we're, imagine we're imaging the United States. So if Landsat 9 were to fly over the East Coast, while we're imaging the East Coast, they are picking up our real-time data in Sioux Falls uh, at a ground station with a 10-meter dish, I think. And those products can be created quickly. I just don't honestly don't know how quickly that would be available. Uh, and it's a different answer for elsewhere uh, around the world, but the stations are connected with networks um, that are obviously much better than they were in Landsat 7 days. One of the things I could talk about going back to Landsat 7 data processing, right? I was the relative young kid in, in the 90s, and we had some of these old timers from Landsat 1, 2, and 3, and they were just astounded that we had 100 gigabyte disk arrays, right, that cost $100,000, and we would have maybe 20 megabit per second networks between the East Coast and Sioux Falls. All of that has just utterly changed in, in the 20 plus years since then. So the networking and and the storage have just revolutionized what we can do with data and that turnaround. So uh, I'm not going to put our colleagues on the spot, but I, I hope products are available within uh, well within a fraction of a day after that kind of imaging pass. But uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's right. I don't have the figures on the top of my head, but I'm pretty certain uh, that uh, in most cases, 90% of the time, uh, the data are available for download after processing uh, in the um, in a matter of hours. So it, it's it's a fraction of a day. And I go back far enough, Jeff, where I remember where data tapes were FedExed from the remote ground stations to uh, Sioux Falls uh, for data processing. So uh, we're we're doing a little better than that now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I spent time in building 28 at Goddard that was built to do early Landsat and it's in the early days I've understood from some of the histories that our colleagues have done that it's more like two weeks to get a single print, a photograph without even digital data from, from those days. And so yes, it's just tremendous how far we've come. Yeah. I only can imagine what it would be like for Landsat, pick a number in the future. So, so Landsat data are not driven by um, requirements for things like weather forecasting, so we can afford to be a little bit slower. Uh, but for things like, you know, when uh, natural disasters occur, people want the data near real time, and, and USGS accommodates that within hours. But, yeah. So, uh, let's see. What um, next one is regarding free access to Landsat data. Can I find a Landsat image of my home or neighborhood? Go ahead, Nima. You know how to answer this one. 
Um, <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, the, the data are available. Um, there are multiple sources. One, th one that I can think of is uh, through USGS Earth Explorer uh, portal. Um, easily you can go ahead and just sign up on the USGS Earth Explorer and um, get um, get the uh, you know pinpoint uh, location that you would like to uh, see the image for, and then you get the image. That's uh, um, you, you know piece of cake. Yeah, and uh, if you want, you can go back and uh, look at your property back to 1972 in the uh, in the archive at USGS. And if you just use Google Earth, uh, one of the brilliant things about Google Earth is they um, put data together from many different uh, satellite sources when you zoom in and you zoom out. But if you go to Google Earth and you're looking at, say, the state to county level, you're probably looking at a Landsat data. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, you have probably looked at your property with Landsat data and might not have even realized uh, that were, you were using Landsat data. So, good. So, I, I see uh, Bree is reminding me that the the next question should be the last question. I don't think I have a next question. So, um, oh, there's one more. Okay, I'm, this will be the last question. Are there any technical obstacles to improve the spatial resolution of the Landsat thermal data to 30 meters? Melody, go ahead. <laughs> yes, um, so the optical design, um, is you know one of the challenges in the detector um, that I can accompany that. Um, NASA Goddard, you know, uh, detector branch um, has great detector can that can accommodate that. What one of the um, challenges we have is the volume of the optics would get much bigger um, to accommodate this uh, this special res resolution of 30 meter. Um, So, I don't know how much to catch, but one of the uh, the optical design uh, completely need to be redesigned because what we have is the you know 100 meter resolution, and um, right now we're working on 60 meter resolution as well. But um, in order to change that, you know, the optical design needs to be changed. Um, it is doable. Goddard, you know, NASA folks. Um, we have great optical designers at Goddard that they can build that, but that's one of the challenges that um, it requires time to get that design together. And also the volume, the volume of the thermal infrared sensor would be much larger. So we got to play with these numbers and a constraint, but definitely doable. We're going to toss, thank you. We're going to toss it back to Bree to wrap up. Uh, today's session. Thank you for your questions and your interest. They were great. This was a lot of fun and um, appreciate the opportunity. Go ahead, Bree. Thank you, Jim, and thank you to all of our presenters for being here today to talk about Earth Science and Landsat 9. Please be sure to tune in to the launch slated for September 16th from Vandenberg, California. To get the VIP experience to view the launch and other activities, please register for the Landsat 9 virtual experience using the link on the screen. The link is also in the chat feature if you missed it on the screen. Thank you for turning in today and stay tuned for more information about upcoming Engage and Getting to Know Goddard events. And I want to thank our partners with Getting to Know Goddard and the Maryland Space Business Roundtable. Have a great day. Thanks, Bree.